intensive farming, shiny intensive farming. And when we talk about the intensive use of synthetic fertilizers, we can farm, but we're using organic fertilizers or manure. But using a, a, a phosphate or synthetic fertilizers emit a lot of methane, TH4, that causes greenhouse gas emissions. Industries also do emit a lot. In Lebanon, we do not have a lot of industries. However, we have the three cement industries that are highly, um, I wouldn't say polluting, uh, but that uh, um, um, use, uh, use pet coke as a fossil fuel, as a fuel for their industrial processes. And pet coke is a highly uh, emittive substance. And it's even worse than uh, diesel or than heavy fuel oil. Um, I can see also deforestation, definitely. Deforestation is not a source of greenhouse gas emissions. But however, forests are a sink of CO2. So when we deforest, obviously we are reducing our sink as a country and we are reducing the chance that we have to capture um, CO2. Um, pollution, a lot of you uh, have said pollution. I just want to, to take this opportunity to, to, to differentiate between uh, climate change and pollution. Um, CO2, if you know, CO2 is not an air pollutant. You know, CO2, we breathe O2, we, we, we expire uh, CO2. CO2 is not by itself an air pollutant. Um, however, CH4 and N2O that are greenhouses are also pollutants. Um, but the CO2 itself, uh, uh, climate change exacerbates air pollution, exacerbates water pollution through water scarcity, for example. But CO2 uh, 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 as, as a gas is not an air pollutant. This is why you cannot find standards for CO2 in the world. You, if you see uh, emission limit standards, you see a lot of standards for CO, for N2O, for uh, SO2, but you never see for CO2. Yeah, no, it's not an air pollutant. So CO2 concentration in the world are only governed or regulated through intervention, international convention, uh, such as uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Which brings me here. So um, we know that a lot of emissions are being are being um, um, emitted, carbon are being emitted. So what is the world doing about this? Just a quick historical snapshot. In 1992, world leaders sat together and said, uh, agreed that climate change was becoming a problem and that something was uh, um, uh, was uh, was needed to be done at a global level and not just at uh, at an individual level. So uh, the Climate Change Convention uh, was, uh, was formed back then. But was, uh, the old countries in the world uh, signed and they were all happy, but nobody did anything about it. So in 1997, they said the protocol came into the Kyoto Protocol said developed countries, so in the sense, um, the rest of the world, including China, India, Brazil, uh, businesses, private sector, industries don't do anything. So it's like, you know, it's like you give a driver, they don't have a driving license, but they just drive. Um, so the world uh, started to think that Kyoto Protocol is not working because not everyone is in the same basket. And after a very long years of negotiations, uh, a, la, a la UN, negotiations a la UN, and uh, uh, I don't want to go into the details, it was a crucifying negotiation process, but finally in 2015, the Paris Agreement was uh, was proposed and was signed uh, uh, by uh, by most of the countries in the world, um, and, uh, uh, and this started a new era in climate change. Lebanon has uh, signed and has ratified the climate change agreement, the Paris Agreement. Akita, you have heard about, uh, you know, Trump and the U.S. They uh, they uh, withdrew themselves from the Paris Agreement uh, when Trump uh, uh, took office. But now with Biden, there is some talks that uh, the U.S. will sign again and will uh, will put again efforts on the table uh, to reduce its its greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, by the way, there are only seven countries in the world who did not ratify. Uh, mostly, there are countries that are in um, uh, in war under war circumstances, like uh, uh, South Sudan, Yemen, Libya, Iraq. But also, you have uh, countries like Iran and Turkey that are high high emitters, but uh, for their personal interests and personal reasons, 
um, uh, they don't want, they did not ratify the Paris Agreement. Any question? I see there's a chat box. It is, uh, it, it, it's such a bad idea to talk about the effectiveness of the UN negotiations. The UN negotiations is a very big debate, Raphael. Um, it takes a lot of time. You know, we are 194 countries on the table to negotiate a climate agreement, and you have lots of interests. Uh, you have countries like small island states that are drowning, but you have also countries like uh, uh, like Saudi Arabia that uh, that uh, that that uh, that lives and survives, and the only source of of GDP is fossil fuel, uh, is 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 fuel extraction. So, uh, and you have China, who is the higher the highest emitter in the world, but who is also saying, you know what, it's my time to develop. Uh, the, uh, you, the industrialized countries, European countries, the US, you had your time to develop, you developed, you caused climate change. Now it's my time and you have no right to put limits to it. It's a big debate and it's a very difficult debate. But finally, in 2015, we did find, uh, we did uh, 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 agree on the Paris Agreement. What is so special about the, the Paris Agreement? First, it has put like a speed limit, you know, it's like you have a drive thing, right? It has put guidelines how to drive economic growth in a climate-friendly manner. So first, let's all drive, but there's a speed limit. We cannot exceed the global average increase in temperature of 2 degrees C. And we should try to not make it increase more than 1.5 degrees C. And this is, if you want, the aspirational goal that all countries are working towards. Second, they said um, each country will have the freedom to choose how much they want to reduce emissions. So uh, um, uh, contrary to the Kyoto Protocol, where it was a top-down approach, where you know UN agencies said, developed countries, you should reduce your emissions by 5% by 2030. Hone, Paris Agreement said, no, it's a bottom-up approach. Please, each country, you know, you do your own assessment and propose what you can, how you can contribute and how much you can contribute to reducing climate change. So this is what we call NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution. The third is that it provided the fuel to drive. It provided the financing. The Green Climate Fund was, uh, was established with $100 billion a year of money to be invested in climate change projects. Um, questions so far, uh, just to see. Decisions, yes. Um, a Paris Agreement so far, there are a lot of conventions, of UN conventions that have, uh, that have uh, led to uh, very positive uh, uh, impacts, by the way, and among which is the Montreal Protocol that, um, that, uh, that was combating the ozone layer. And if you know by now, no one is talking about ozone, uh, ozone depletion anymore, because yes, the world has succeeded in closing the ozone hole and to stop the use of CFCs and any um, um, other ozone depleting substances. So within the UN world, there are some good examples, but there are also some more difficult examples on how uh, these multilateral conventions work. Um, this is a whole other debate about uh, uh, global governance, the global crisis, and how as a world, uh, we have to fight together um, um, a global issue. If, yes, Leia, can we can we open the floor like for a few minutes? Maybe they have yes. live questions, so we can maybe stop sharing sure. the slides, and then just for two or three minutes, uh, we can stop sharing, and then um, and then if you want to ask like live questions, do you have any question or comment concerning what has been said? Wissam? So I, yes, I can see. Okay, NGC. So Wissam, I didn't get the meaning of NGC. So NGC is a commitment. It is in. Uh, every country has to put on the table a commitment saying, I will reduce my emissions by 20% from now till 2030. All countries in the world are using the same methodology and the same target here that is 2030. So you have countries like uh, uh, the EU, they said they want to reduce by 50% the CO2 emissions by 2030. 
You have countries like Jordan, they said 1%. Uh, you have countries uh, like the US, they said 28%, but then they withdrew from the Paris Agreement. So each country has to put a target forward and has to report the progress that it's doing in order to meet the target. And in 2030, the global, so all parties sit together and evaluate if this was enough or if more has to be done. Um, I'm trying to read, uh, you know, um, so uh, um, what blended finance opportunity are being explored in Lebanon to finance a just transition? Uh, yes, we will, uh, we will come to finance and to the role of the private sector and more into, into impact and investments, which I know you're a big fan of. Um, but there are, uh, there are a lot of opportunities, whether from multilateral agencies, from international development banks, uh, to finance, uh, uh, to accelerate the implementation of the NDCs and to finance just transition. Um, among which, uh, for example, there is the NDC partnership where most of the developed countries are putting money to build the capacities, but also help in, in, in investing in clean technologies to leapfrog into, uh, into a cleaner uh, um, um, energy world. Um, the 1.5 and 2 degrees, so um, we compare uh, usually um, uh, the world, how do we compare the increase in temperature? We compare it to a 1990 level. So we know in 1990, uh, what was the average global temperature? And based on the 1990, we, uh, we track how much today in 2020, uh, how much more, uh, 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 what is the increased average temperature in the world? And uh, all models say that we cannot exceed an increase uh, uh, of two degrees. If, if, if the world by, 20, uh, by the end of the century um, uh, surpasses the two degrees Celsius, the world and planet Earth and the ecosystems, the natural ecosystems will not be able to adapt and to, and to overcome the increase in warming. And this is why the alarm, uh, um, the, we are really ringing the, uh, the alarm. Um, a, a question from Dana also. Um, so uh, yes, a question about why most polluting countries, um, uh, they have to take the burden and to diminish most of the, of the, of the emissions. And since it's their own interest to keep emitting and producing at the same place. Um, that's true, Dana. It is, uh, it is uh, uh, you know, emissions, uh, uh, emission is directly correlated to, to economic growth. And uh, uh, studies show that you cannot really, I mean, reducing emissions can reduce your economic growth unless you invest, you leapfrog, you invest in technologies, you invest really in, uh, 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 in, in clean technologies, which by the way, can bring you food security, can bring you energy security. You know, a lot of countries, they want to be energy, uh, uh, energy independent uh, and not be dependent on, on, on having, uh, having to, um, to rely on other countries and other interests of countries to provide them with gas, with fuel. They don't want to be victims of the fluctuation of fossil fuel prices. So there is also a lot of geopolitical interests in actually reducing emissions and in uh, um, going into a cleaner path. Um, I'll take maybe just one, one more question. Um, Yes, temperature cannot increase more than two degrees. Um, let's let's continue and move uh, maybe more into uh, um, maybe move into uh, into Lebanon. What we are doing in Lebanon and uh, where were we? We were here. Voila. Um, so um, focusing more on uh, on Lebanon. Um, so we are, uh, uh, we emit 0.06% of global emissions. So yes, we do not contribute to climate change, um, but, but the main sources of greenhouse gas emissions in Lebanon are the energy and transport sector, which happen also to be uh, the two most, uh, most uh, the biggest economical, social and financial and environmental problems in Lebanon. 
So when we talk about climate change and reducing emissions in Lebanon from climate change, we always think, let's take this as an opportunity to fix our electricity, to go into a cleaner and um, an energy transition, to invest in renewable energy, and to maybe also invest in clean transportation and public transportation. Also, as you can see, industries and waste management are also sources of, uh, of CO2 emissions. And our forestry sector is a sink. So uh, it, it removes around 3 million tons of CO2 per, uh, um, per year, um, which is something that we are, we are proud of as a, as a country. Um, so although we do not emit uh, a, a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions, we are highly vulnerable. So climate projections that were run on Lebanon show that there will be an increase in temperature from three to five degrees, three on the coast, five inland, and more towards uh, uh, the Bekaa. We will have a decrease in rainfall. And not just this, the important and the interesting part in climate change is not uh, that it, we will have a decrease. We will have a very uh, uh, different patterns of rainfall in Lebanon. Yani, maybe eventually we will have a similar, uh, not a very big difference between uh, uh, the average precipitation per year. But instead of having rain for two weeks, we will have them in two days. So obviously this will strain our drainage system. We will have urban flooding, we will have rural flooding, uh, we will have flooding of, uh, of, the, of agricultural fields. And uh, we have all witnessed this during the last uh, five or six years. And this is what we call uh, extreme, extreme events. And this is of fact, the climate, climate modeling show more and more that these extreme events will happen uh, and not just an increase in average. Uh, and obviously all this will have big impacts on water resources, on agriculture, on public health, uh, increasing mortality and morbidity, on tourism, because we will have a decrease in snow cover, even maybe there, there are some talks about not having a ski season anymore, because we will have a lot of uh, snow during a small period, which means that we will not have a long enough snow uh, uh, on the mountains to have a ski period and to actually uh, make the ski lifts operational anymore. Impact on electricity, already we are seeing a huge uh, increase in, in, in cooling demand in summer. And this is also uh, increasing emissions. So it's a, really, it's a circle, it's a vicious uh, circle. And all this, so this is not just a mere environmental problem. All this has a huge cost on the government and on households. If you can see here the two peaks, these are the, the, the impacts of climate change on public health uh, from additional mortalities and morbidities. And here we cost uh, these impacts uh, from, uh, uh, you know, the productivity of a human being that, uh, that can give through, through his or her life. An increase in food prices, because obviously with, with climate change, uh, we, will have, uh, uh, we will have a different distribution of food production in the world. So, and Lebanon, since we rely a lot on imports of, uh, of raw products, of food products, uh, food products will be very expensive and then um, uh, global food prices will increase and uh, uh, actually the Lebanese household at the end of the day will pay the biggest bill of climate change. Um, so this is all to say that climate change is not uh, just an environmental issue. It's linked to a lot of uh, um, um, a lot of uh, a sort of, uh, um, an economic, uh, um, uh, really uh, important financial, economic, and social aspects in, in our everyday life, um, in our government, for the government, for a country's sovereignty, but also for a just transition, for human rights, gender equality, and public participation. And this is all linked to the SDGs that you have all uh, uh, heard of, the Sustainable Development Goal, and uh, SDG 13, which is climate action, is actually the, uh, one of the few SDGs that is linked to the other uh, 16 SDGs. Um, questions at this stage about global climate change before I move into uh, the business world and climate change, Fazi? Yes, so maybe we can again stop sharing and then open the floor for some questions. If you open your mic and, 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 and ask clash questions, it will be interesting too, if you want to. 
If you have questions or comments, who would like to speak? Yeah, can I speak? Uh, yes. I'm Samir Majdaleni. Of course, uh, if you open your, your camera, it's better. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sky, can you please uh, elaborate if uh, you are aware of uh, the effects of climate change on the sea and the fisheries sector and the fisheries production, uh, which might be occurring in Lebanon? Thank you. Would you like to answer, Leia, or you pick all the questions before? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Samir, uh, for the question. Um, yes, climate change will impact the fishery sector, both, uh, uh, especially that it's one of the, uh, it's a very important um, economic sector uh, for the livelihoods of, of, of a lot of fishermen. Um, the latest studies that have been conducted by the Balaman University uh, show that we will have uh, we will have some uh, some fish species that will disappear and some fish species um, that have a high uh, a high value uh, for fishermen. And, you know, they are good. Uh, they are uh, they are they have a big market in Lebanon. And unfortunately, because of climate change, we have invasive species of fish in the Mediterranean Sea coming from from the south that are actually competing with local uh, with with local fish. On, uh, on resources, on food resources, and on uh, uh, on on, uh, uh, on on the ecosystem. Um, so fisheries will be impacted. Uh, uh, plus, if you don't just see the fish species and the fish, so we're talking about a change in the species and in the quantities. But also a third aspect is, is that uh, with extreme events. It's going to be more challenging to fish in the sea. You know, you will have now more uh, higher waves, uh, a more intense storm. So the days of fishing or the time spent on fishing by fishermen is expected to be reduced with time. Uh, we hope that with technology advances, maybe fishing will be more effective using less uh, working hours. Uh, uh, but definitely, it's it's one of the sectors that will be hit. And by the way. Samir, the Ministry of Agriculture Strategy, the Ministry of Agriculture Strategy for 2020 and 2025, have captured this uh, uh, this field into their action plan, and they are planning uh, to really uh, um, um, implement some adaptation actions to help fishermen and help the fishing industry to survive. Thank you, Leah. Masaad, you have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, in fact, it's not a question, it's uh, just a, a small clarification. Each time we are tackling the climate change issue in Lebanon, we just talk uh, in general, and especially when it touches the water resources aspect, is all chart where it shows the variation of temperature and also in, rain, in rainfall. And when you talk about rainfall, uh, Ms. Claire talked already about maybe it will not change, but the intensity will be different and the frequency, which will have also an impact on our infiltration and our water resource system. However, what is the accuse of the data that you are building our interpretation, our assumption uh, in Lebanon? It means what are the rainfall stations? Do we have really long time series? Uh, it's good to have at least one or two charts showing that there's a variation happening. Because if you go to the old data, you know, when I did my PhD, we had some cycles where we had high temperature, we had zero snow, and where we had a lot of rainfall and even a very, very low rainfall. So this was my clarification on the matter. Thank you, Masad. Uh, Thank you, Masad. Indeed, it's uh, uh, there is. So I'm sure you are aware that in Lebanon we have uh, we have uh, a challenge in data, especially with uh, with weather data, uh, because of the war. Uh, um, because of the war in Lebanon, the civil war, we have a lot of intermittent data uh, with re um, related to weather. Uh, uh, and also to water. But with what we have, and you know, with the advances in climate modeling, at least if it's not accurate enough, at least I think it gives us a clear indication where we're going. And the indication is that we are going to a higher temperature and to a lower precipitation in the near future. 
So maybe we can continue the presentation, Leah, and then we keep last minutes for other questions. Yes, sure. Um, so moving to uh, the main, if you want, the main, uh, um, the main aim of the presentation is to link climate change with uh, the performance of the private sector, the opportunities. Is climate change only a risk or is it also an opportunity? And how is the private sector and businesses dealing with it? Um, so uh, um, there are really, it's not, it's not a coincidence that, that um, for the last maybe five years or so, uh, climate change has become a, a familiar face in the headlines and on the agenda of business leaders uh, um, and, uh, and world leaders. And this is because really you can feel that the world is worried about what, how climate change, um, how climate will actually change the way the world is producing and the world is performing. And a good proof of this was the last uh, World Economic Forum in Davos in 2019 where uh, prime ministers, the kings and businesses uh, um, actually sat on the, on the table to discuss uh, the world challenges. And environment and climate uh, related risk accounted uh, for three of the top five risks uh, that the world leaders are seeing in terms of likelihood and by impact. If you can see here, for example, so this is what uh, world leaders are uh, seeing as the risk for the coming decade. And you can see uh, up uh, here, up in the, in, the, in the yellow circle, that failure to climate change, extreme weather events, and natural disaster became the most worrying risks in terms of likelihood and in terms of severities that business leaders are looking for. And it actually, it surpassed the risk of fiscal crisis, corruption, illegal trades, uh, uh, um, and income disparity that traditionally business leaders used to put as a priorities in their business planning. So this is, uh, it shows really, um, it shows a, uh, a trend, awareness trend, but also I would say a risk trend in incorporating climate change in the way businesses are planning, uh, planning their risks and are planning their opportunities. So um, for example, I'm sharing with you here um, um, a study that was done uh, by, uh, by PwC uh, um, a couple of years back where 130 CEOs, big CEOs around the world uh, were surveyed and uh, just uh, to prioritize the risks that they see uh, for, for their businesses. And as you can see here, we have, um, um, we have around 60% of CEOs around the world said that energy price rise, so from climate change, the risk is uh, energy price rise uh, 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 that will actually impact their business operations directly. Um, also, climate change risks that they are um, that they are worried about are some government regulations. For example, in some countries, you have a carbon tax. Uh, um, so this also uh, impacts and concerns the CEOs uh, for their operation. Uh, also, climate change risks can disrupt supply chain. So when you rely a lot on raw material, on food product, on agricultural product, but maybe also on shipping, uh, on air travel. Um, um, so this also climate has a big, climate change has a big impact on, uh, on supply change uh, and on raw material shortage and costs. So it's not just uh, an environmental matter. Uh, uh, all these are risks that companies do take into consideration, do account for in their budget planning, do account for in their risk logs, so that they are prepared and that they take all precautions possible to avoid that this disrupts uh, their, um, um, their, um, their work. And actually we have seen, uh, we have seen lately uh, in the US two years ago in 2019, the polar vortex that, that hit the US and then just paralyzed the whole country for, for a week. Uh, and it was really um, 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 all over the headline. And this actually had a, had, a, had a price and the price was around $1 billion for really a couple of days or maybe maximum a week where the country was, was, was freezed. 
um, this was of course before COVID and now we all know what COVID did and maybe we'll talk later about the similarities a little bit about climate change and, and the COVID crisis. But uh, um, and so what I want to say that businesses are aware that climate extremes are costing the economy, are costing their operations a lot of money. And also we also in Lebanon, uh, some climate uh, uh, events uh, how they really impacted uh, businesses, uh, uh, transportation movement in Lebanon, uh, even refugees. So this is uh, this has uh, humanitarian and financial implications to it. Um, I can see now, Matt uh, Sfer, uh, do you want to ask something? Okay, and also from from uh, from a uh, yes, Namat. Yeah, my question was sent in writing. I was wondering what uh, the percentage of impact of Lebanon's emission over the world's emission. And suppose zero. that emission and emission in Lebanon are zero. How much does it affect the world's emission? Thank, Thank you. you. So, super, super good question. Uh, as I said, we uh, emit 0.06% of world emissions. So which means if today we become carbon neutral, we turn off all our power plants or uh, all our cars, we won't impact the world. However, Namat, there is much more than reducing emissions by tackling climate change. By tackling climate change, you are providing clean energy. You are reducing air pollution. You are reducing um, um, respiratory problems. Lebanon is a highly polluted country. Uh, um, and we all see, by tackling climate change, you can attract financing to have a cleaner public transportation, to have a more, more sustainable agricultural systems, to have more sustainable waters. So I don't want you to think about climate change as, you know, it's this global problem for rich countries. We're not there yet. Let us just uh, um, um, solve our problems, our, you know, our everyday problems before thinking about climate change. But what I always say, you know, when I meet, um, when we uh, when we meet ministers, parliamentarians, and decision makers, I never actually talk about climate change. I try to talk their language. Uh, so, for example, the Ministry of Energy, they want at the end of the day to have electricity, to be to to be independent, to have clean electricity. So we work with them to have natural gas, to have more wind power, to have solar power. With Ministry of Public Transportation, for example, uh, or uh, um, they cannot, uh, they are not being able to. Uh, to, to put in place a good public transportation system. Okay, very good. Let's work with them on having at least cleaner, cleaner cars. We have around 1.75 million cars in Lebanon. Step, let's work with the government to make cleaner cars, to have cleaner cars, to have cleaner fuel. So we, do, we are not doing this to fight climate change. We are doing this first to uh, solve our environmental problems, second, to solve our economic problems, especially when it comes to energy. And third, to be able to live a citizen in a country that is clean and that has opportunities. Um, I don't know if this answered uh, your, um, your, your concern, uh, but yes, we do, get, uh, um, um, we do get a lot, this comment a lot. And uh, we are not the only country in the world that does not emit and that uh, works towards reducing emissions, but also we are vulnerable to climate change, Namat. Uh, uh, climate change will impact uh, our economy and our systems. And we need to show a little bit of commitment from our side so that we get the support from uh, the international community to better adapt. Um, going back so to the private sector uh, and to the impact of climate change uh, on the private sector, um, just recently, I came across a very interesting study that says, so for future uh, professionals, for all you students out there, what are the jobs that climate change will affect? So there will be, uh, there are jobs that will uh, disappear or that will be very challenging, uh, like pilots. Uh, apparently, um, uh, pilots hate being late, right? Uh, they hate having delays. And because of climate change, a lot of pilots ha are having delays in their flights. And this is causing a lot of stress uh, 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 in their work. So um, there's a trend of having less and less pilots. 
actually uh, being uh, uh, enrolling in such and uh, such work because of the stress that the climate is bringing them. Construction workers uh, working outdoor. This is really, I mean, it's it's becoming a, a high, a very high challenge. Electricity workers, the conventional electricity workers that work in power plants, uh, for example. Um, rice farmers also uh, in, in, in Asia, uh, because rice is one of the crops that will be uh, impacted uh, uh, by, by climate change. And, and um, there's a lot of farmers that, uh, have, that their livelihoods depend on rice. Uh, but at but the same time, a lot of new jobs will, will emerge, jobs in renewable energy, as you may know, so uh, in technology and smart technologies, uh, nuclear power, whether we agree or not, I mean, this is a whole debate, but nuclear power is a clean power. Uh, it's not a safe power, maybe it's not a, a, politically, a politically correct source of energy, but it is a clean one. Um, in transport services, so a lot of new technologies are really, you know, innovation and technology in transportation is a new thing, and insurance companies. Uh, because of now climate extremes, so there are a lot of new money they say uh, money in insurance companies uh, that they can that they can put and that they can make profit uh, of uh, from uh, from climate extreme events. And here also, uh, um, impact investment come comes into uh, uh, into place. Uh, I'm not sure if you if uh, if you're um, if you're up to date with you know uh, uh, now the uh, the big investment companies, uh, even the small ones, they are all trying to direct uh, their investment into impact investment. And climate change is becoming one of the main areas that uh, such investment companies and such uh, investment agencies uh, um, are putting their um, their money into. And how are businesses actually reacting? You know, uh, so we have risks. We have changing in the in the in the employment profile um, of companies. Um, how are businesses? Uh, uh, what are businesses doing? Um, first, they are innovating, and innovation is something that is um, uh, that is easy for for everyone. Everyone can. And you don't need to be the U.S. to innovate. Uh, you don't need uh, a really innovation, uh, like we say in French, à la portée de tout le monde. So um, innovation is definitely, innovation and technology is definitely um, 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 a way forward. And a lot of money is being put in order to, uh, to invest in new technologies um, and new technologies that can push the world, that can help the world uh, make the transition in an easier and less disruptive way. And uh, for example, uh, we have um, Bill Gates invested around, uh, uh, um, um, around uh, um, I think $5 billion in something called Breakthrough Coalition uh, that, uh, that has uh, 27 of the world's richest uh, um, uh, companies and they invested in new energy technology, uh, a new energy technology uh, so that really they can be uh, at the top of, uh, of their game and they can help the world in, in moving into technological breakthrough. Uh, especially in clean energy. As you can see here, for example, um, um, uh, the transit to clean energy is becoming very affordable. Uh, between 2008 and 2013, by the way, the price of photovoltaic, of, of PV, dropped by 80%, uh, um, because as the Chinese industry gained, uh, gained uh, some strength. So this fundamentally changed the economics of solar power. And suddenly you can see from solar power across the world. And for example, and this uh, allowed uh, some companies like Apple, Google, Ikea uh, to invest money and to put a target as high as 100% of renewable energy uh, to, be, uh, to be used by Google, by Ikea operation and by Apple operation. So this would not have been possible if solar energy and technology did not bring the prices down uh, to actually pledge and put money into uh, into into renewable energy and into a hundred percent target uh, for such big companies. Um, also, um, I'm investing investing responsibly. Uh, a lot of companies are investing responsibly, and here we talk also about about impact um, um, impact investment. 
So investing in new technology reduces cost, investing in uh, um, actually in, in user expectations and having you know, a CSR profile or being uh, environmentally friendly uh, uh, increases the market demand. Uh, also regulatory changes and access to climate funds that the government uh, uh, enable can increase private, uh, private investment uh, and uh, also a greater awareness of the risks of climate change reduce the risk. So uh, uh, where we put our investments as companies uh, make a big difference in, um, in really accelerating uh, the, the transition to, to a cleaner world. Um, also, what companies are doing and what we can do is raise your voice. Um, just a nice, a nice story. Do you know which commercial ad is the most expensive ad in the world? Um, it's the Super Bowl uh, ad. You know, in the States, there's the Super Bowl. Um, that's, uh, you know, it's about uh, 172 million viewers are expected to be on their TVs watching Super Bowl. And uh, in 2019, um, uh, Budweiser was was, uh, uh, was the the, uh, the main sponsor of the Super Bowl, and they spent 5.2 million dollars for this message. So this was the uh, the on the Super Bowl, and it's about clean clean electricity and uh, um, and uh, renewable energy. Um, any questions so far? Fadi, do you want me to slow down? As you wish, if you want to, to open the floor for a few minutes, we can do it. Um, new, uh, I have a question about nuclear power. Um, yes, definitely. As I said, nuclear power is a controversial technology. Uh, we have a problem definitely with Uh, the objective of the session, but just to relay to your, con your connection is unstable. It's just a fact. Okay, uh, Fedy, can you hear me? Yes, uh, can we stop sharing a little bit uh, the presentation layout so we can pick some questions? Yes, yes, Masad. Yeah, in fact, I have. Uh, one item which Leo already answered regarding the nuclear power, because you know it's very dangerous when we are in the presentation to go and state that this is a clear energy. It's clean, yes, in terms of emissions, but however, you know, because I worked on this matter in France uh, during my, my studies, still now we did not find a solution what to do with the waste coming out of uh, the nuclear uh, power plants. The other thing, you know, I'll just divert back to the question of the precipitation, because after we finish the question and answer, you said that we can see that precipitation is going down. You know, if you go for the people who are watching the news every night and now in the news in Lebanon, they talk a lot about rainfall uh, in the weather the part. We have seen that 2009, uh, 20, so it was an average year, 2019 was an exceeding year. So if you go to cycles, we don't know, but we know there are trends in terms of temperature and uh, rainfall. Maybe if we can do uh, similar studies on counties which have already long-term uh, data series for rainfall and temperature and also weather data, this could even uh, put more uh, power on our climate change, let's say, uh, policies and whatever comes next. The last thing that I want to say regarding the CEOs and company, I work in oil and gas company. I'm uh, the head of the water business in Shlombazje, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. And we are working a lot now toward what we call green energy, despite that we are oil and gas uh, company. And also our competitors like Beck and Halliburton are doing the same. Now they are shifting on the geothermal energy, which is still something uh, a bit shy in terms of percentage for global energy, but also they are funding for the solar for wind. And the best, you know, the main things that they can do in terms of gas, we are reworking again, how we can store our emission, how we can inject our CO2 emissions and put them into the deep aquifers or reuse the wells that were uh, used for oil production and store the uh, CO2 in it. So this was my intervention, uh, Fadi.
Thank you, thank you, Masad. And Leia, sorry. Uh, uh, we have some questions, Leia, but, but maybe we can discuss them by the end of the presentation, if you would like to continue, and then we can have like uh, like 20 minutes to, to full discussion and to answer all the questions. Is it okay with you? Yes, yes, great, okay. and thank you. And uh, thank you. Uh, um, uh, maybe we'll we'll have time to discuss it later. Let me go back uh, to sharing some uh, um, some stories uh, and some stories around the world about uh, private sector. Um, so yes, uh, so we were talking about some of the um, you know, raising voices, uh, some of the tools that companies are using. They're using actually the notorious and their presence to that uh, that is reducing uh, their their beef production they're trying to have more sustainable beef production uh, their energy usage as sourcing packaging and waste uh, um, and they are reducing they are their aim is to reduce 64 percent of global emissions uh, we have apple too that they are producing phones that are fuel efficient and ikea i'm sure you know is one of the main leaders in sustainability in the world uh, in terms of uh, uh, material usage, but also in terms of uh, packaging and, uh, and, and energy sourcing. In Lebanon also, we have seen a movement, a big movement from private companies who start working towards uh, climate change and not only in greenwashing, uh, not, just, you know, not just part of their CSR strategies, but part of their business plan and business strategies, for example, Bank Audi uh, uh, mobilized $200 million to finance green solutions. This was not part of their CSR. It was part of their business plan, and it's part of how they see their bank uh, um, um, progressing and developing uh, in the future to cater for the new needs that are coming in the market. Uh, Bank Audi, but there, there are also France Bank that were do, was, was doing some good work. Um, BLC Bank also, so uh, I just put the story and I just put back out there as an, as an example. Um, but also we can see that uh, uh, car companies like Porsche, for example, that are starting last year, uh, all, the, uh, all the billboards were, were actually displaying the new Cayenne e-hybrid and electric car, uh, not just electric, the e-hybrid. I'm sure a lot of you now will ask me how we can have electric cars if we don't have electricity. And the answer is, <laughs> We are, uh, we will try now to move into hybrid cars and e-hybrid cars, what we call plug-in hybrid, before moving into electric cars. And uh, a lot of, so we have Jaguar, we have uh, um, uh, Porsche, uh, Toyota, a lot of companies chose next, last year to put their marketing campaign for the summer on electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. Um, also, what private sector and uh, uh, what, what the private sector can do is play a very, very crucial role to governments. And as you, as you see, um, companies that are large enough uh, they have the ear of the government. So uh, if they have the ear of the government, they can bend the ear of the government and they can actually not just whisper solutions and propose uh, some decisions, but they can also uh, um, support decision makers to take a certain decision. You know, sometimes you have a parliamentarian or a minister or a prime minister that wants to do something forward looking. And then, but uh, with, the, with the support, uh, whether financial support, whether lobby support, whether, you know, technical support from the private sector, usually it pushes decision makers to um, to make a decision and Lebanon is not different than than other places in the world as you can see uh, our decision makers and our businessmen uh, sometimes are the same uh, and uh, maybe this is something good maybe this is something bad it's also a debate that I would not uh, I'd rather not open in this session but just to say that private sector in Lebanon uh, has the power to influence decision making so let's use this power to influence it in a in a good, a positive, and transformative way. Um, also, what companies are doing around the world and in Lebanon is they're joining each other. Um, if you're a businessman, if you're an entrepreneur, if you work with a company that uh, uh, has this, you know, this green spirit, usually they 
um, they join each other, they meet each other and they plan uh, uh, with each other. There's something called women business, a global, um, a global huge um, association that actually puts companies together, help companies inspire each other for change and anyone can join them by the way. There's the Nazca platform also with the, within the UN family that also it's not just companies, but it's cities, it's investors and regions that can pledge their ambition track and be part of this, of such a family. There's the, um, the climate group CDP and in Lebanon in 2016, we have founded the Lebanon Climate Act, which is you know, our own interpretation of a group or a network of companies that want to work towards uh, um, climate change goals. Uh, and, um, and so far uh, we have around 100 companies that work uh, regularly with us to calculate the carbon footprint, to, uh, to put in place uh, some action plans to reduce, let's say their transport costs. And by saying, again, by saying reduce their CO2 emissions, automatically this is translated by reducing their costs. Whether it's transport costs, operational costs, whether it's, it's employee engagement, employee productivity. Now, a lot of people, you know, in 2016, we were talking about the benefits of working from home on reducing emissions and on reducing traffic. And now people are seeing, and the world have, has witnessed, unfortunately, and, and uh, through a crisis, but we have witnessed how much emissions and how much CO2 have reduced due to the lockdown and due to this working from home modality. Um, so yes, in Lebanon, this was prior to 2020, in 2020, the private sector have other worries uh, and, and other concerns uh, to deal with. But prior to 2020, um, Lebanese companies were really looking forward to be engaged in this, uh, um, um, in this movement. Maybe I'll keep questions till the, till the end. I don't think I have a lot uh, of more slides. Uh, um, Lebanon, what Lebanon is doing, uh, just a quick snapshot. We are part of the UNFCCC. We are part of the Paris Agreement. We have pledged, so we have pledged to reduce our emissions by 15% by 2030 as an unconditional goal and 30% by 2030 as a conditional target. And this mainly comes from a shift to natural gas, an increase in renewable energy, increase in forestation, and an increase the recycling rate um, in Lebanon. Um, I'm not sure if you know, but for those who knew, for example, in 2018, we have succeeded in passing uh, an article and the budget law to uh, remove taxes from green cars, from hybrid and electric cars. Uh, this was a law that we have prepared in 2009, and it only uh, um, saw the light in 2018. And we were proud to, 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 to have seen it and the budget law of 2018 and 2019. Um, so today, if you want to buy, not today, okay, last year, a hybrid car or, or, or electric car, it's, uh, it's uh, tax-free, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's tax-free, so it's actually, it costs the same as a normal, a regular uh, car might cost you. Uh, um, we also have today a new target of 30% renewable energy and a target, a government target of 40 million trees uh, by, by 2030. So this is what the government committed itself. And we are working with multilateral agencies, with development banks, with the private sector to meet this target. Um, so this is from, uh, uh, from a government point, uh, point of view. But as you may know, climate change has a, 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 it's either the responsibility of, of everyone. Uh, when we see, when we talk about energy, transport, the food consumption, waste, this is the responsibility of every single person and every single company. So maybe to end, uh, uh, to end our discussion today, I would like to hear from you uh, through also joining the, the Woodclap app. Um, how can you as individuals contribute to the fight against climate change? I'll stop sharing. Fazi, yes, so, yes, thank you. Uh, so, so we can interact on this application. If you go to your mobile or to the address, we, uh, we put the address in the chat box. So you can go to your cell phone to answer the second question. I will be launching the question.
So I'll be sharing the results. Can you see the answers, Zelea? Yes. So reducing energy by less one use plastics, work from home and reduce transportation, uh, buy less planting, éviter la surconsommation, planting trees, use LED uh, lights, walk, recycle, planting trees, use solar power, invest and support companies, companies with a sustainable approach, Great ideas. Super good ideas. I'm taking notes. Um, use, use reusable bags, reduce fossil, get involved in politics, renovate instead of building new, switch to green power, consume less, shop locally and support small businesses, Green decisions, hybrid cars, being mindful of water, electricity. Donate instead of throwing things. Talk about climate change. Yes, yes. Great. Uh, um, this is uh, this is really great. Um, the solar power. Um, let me just, is, is there any new idea coming up with you, Fadi? Uh, thrifting, centralizing production to reduce transportation. Yes, centralization. Decentralization, I would say. Yes. So I, I totally agree with the, um, with all all what was proposed, I even like some of uh, uh, um, some of the suggestions that I didn't think uh, of, like uh, uh, be involved in politics. Yes, <laughs> be involved in politics definitely through NGOs, through lobbying. Uh, um, you cannot uh, you cannot imagine how much through media actually how much uh, decisions and decision makers are influenced by what people want and what people um, um, actually ask. Um, uh, I like, so I see a lot uh, um, with the, that, is, uh, that is linked to energy use, uh, to use of solar energy and green and green energy. Uh, eating less animal products. Um, yes, livestock production in Lebanon, if we really want to talk about Lebanon. Um, in Lebanon, uh, uh, um, our livestock, so we do not have really a big livestock production. And uh, however, we do have emissions from, uh, from our livestock. Most of our products, our animal products are, are imported. And yes, uh, sometimes they say being vegetarian is, uh, is, um, is indeed climate friendly, although it is debatable with the, the pressure that it puts on agricultural systems and on fertilizers uh, um, to be used. So a lot of energy using clean energy, just to put you in the loop here in Lebanon. In Lebanon as a company, as a house, as an industry, you can use solar power, but you cannot sell solar power to the grid the way it is in France and Germany uh, and, and, other, and, and other places due to unfortunately a law that, uh, that just gives this uh, this uh, this advantage to EDN. So yes, there, there there is a monopoly. However, what you can do as individuals, as businesses and households, solar water heaters are a great invention. And I talk from a personal uh, um, experience. If you have place on your roof, this is really it. It, uh, it saves money. It saves electricity, and it's such an easy uh, easy process where. There's always hot, hot water. So this is definitely something that joins everything together. Um, energy, uh, you can also put solar energy and do something that is called a smart meter. So EDL is providing this modality where you can produce electricity from a PV, use it, and what you, you will not be using it during the month, uh, uh, you, they, they deduce it from, so they take it and they deduce it from your uh, your bill, your next month bill. 
So this smart metering system has has uh, is uh, is starting to uh, is starting to take um, to take uh, movement and motion here in Lebanon, and a lot of companies and industries uh, are actually investing in this. Um, yes, I can see it. Naamat, yes, he want to. Yes, please. To interfere, yes, Naamat. Yes, please. Excuse me, uh, but uh, it's this seems very optimistic. Uh, I, I, after my six, 40 or 50 years experience in this field, I'm not such uh, as optimistic as you are. You can apply uh, solar energy, you can transform Lebanon in uh, uh, aeolian. We, uh, the whole country would, would um, if you want to produce electricity as zero emission, you could cancel all our industry, whatever, uh, as low as uh, we are polluting. You will not make us feel better in Lebanon. Situation will not be better because we are we are impacting 0.06 percent on the global uh, pollution, global uh, emission. Go talk to China. Go talk to the uh, to the Russia. Go talk to United States. Go talk to Germany about reducing pollution because even if my emission is zero, uh, we're still breathing pollution and poison. Okay. What, what I'm saying here is that. The solution at our scale is not within our hand. Okay, we can, I told you at the beginning, zero emission will impact nothing on our, my country. As long as Syria is polluting, Israel is polluting, Turkey is polluting, Sweden is pollu not polluting, Italy is polluting, China is polluting, I will still breathe, still be breathing shit. Okay, so now China Thank has you, stopped, uh, China has stopped the um, they were limiting birth to one child per couple. Now they have canceled it. Okay, so now in twenty in twenty years from now, they will be two point five billion person in China, breathing C and exhaling, exhaling CO two. The stop 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 population growth. If you can do that at the world scale, stop population growth because we are the first polluters. In the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Namat. Maybe we can continue the discussion by the end of the webinar. Thank you. We are the first polluters. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Namat. Thank you. The blame on industry. Thank you, Namat. We're not putting the blame on industries. I'd like to, yes, to add just to put two concepts. Think globally, act locally. You know, uh, uh, whether we want it or not, we are part of the global community. Uh, there's something that we always use in climate change negotiations that is common but differentiated responsibility. There is a common responsibility, but the scale of responsibility is different. What we are doing in Lebanon is proportional to our capacities. What China is doing is proportional to its capacities. Maybe, maybe they, they, they can do more. And this is why climate change negotiations happen. And this is why we go to each climate change negotiations. We work with allies, with partner countries like us, developed countries, South American countries, uh, uh, um, uh, Asian countries. We work together to put uh, a pressure, international pressure on countries like Brazil, like India, like China to uh, have more ambitious target. This is part of these international negotiations and it's, it's being worked on diplomatic channels. Ms. Leo, um, Ms. Leo, but, just but, a word. Uh, let me let me just uh, um, just continue. No, 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 no. Let me tell um, you in, uh, the the problem the, the, the since Rio first uh, first conference on uh, on uh, uh, environment in Rio in 1982. What people doesn't tell you is that back then it was already late, too late. Now the, this uh, we are sitting all together. That's not true. We are sitting together saying so many nice things, but we are doing whatever, whatever we need to do to increase income, increase uh, money, more, more money. We just live to earn, to make more money. That's it. We don't care about who is dead, who is alive. So please, these are things that uh, beyond Lebanon and beyond, beyond the human, the, the problem is the human, uh, how do you say? We are yes, not much yes. if you uh, don't know what, what I suggest, because this debate is very, very interesting, Mr. Namad, if you agree, 
just to continue the presentation because Leah has some just ideas to present to us and then we can continue. It's very interesting. Just open the debate. I was talking because you opened the debate. Yes, yes, of the course. We can continue. Of course, this is very interesting. We'll continue this discussion, uh, of course, after, after Leah finishes her presentation, if you agree. Okay, Leah, so we can go on. Unmute. Yes, um, just to, uh, um, um, it's, it's an interesting debate, uh, I'm not negating this, uh, but it's, it's a big debate, it's a debate about the um, sociopolitical, geopolitical, it's about the social system against the capitalistic system, I mean, this, this, uh, uh, this will never end, but let me just continue, uh, at least from from my point of view, uh, from the point of view of thinking globally, acting locally, that this is a responsibility um, um, for everyone. Um, I think the first thing, and I urge uh, uh, skeptics that say that we cannot do anything about it to change their mind. And believe me, a change of behavior and admitting that this is everyone's problem is one way, I'm not saying that it's the way, it's one way to move things forward. No government or scientist can fix it for us. We are in all in this together. So we really have to change our lifestyles. Um, uh, this overconsumption, you all said about overconsumption. Yes, and I think the COVID-19 sanitary crisis and this lockdown uh, really showed the world that we can consume less, uh, uh, move less, transport our commute less, see each other less, buy less, Maybe here in Lebanon, uh, with the socioeconomic uh, uh, crisis, we are still alive, we are surviving. It's true, it's very hard, but overconsumption is definitely something that we can do. Um, innovation, innovation, and not reinventing the wheel, you know, sometimes a small idea can change the way, um, 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 the way we act. I like the shop locally, uh, shop locally uh, and avoid import, uh, definitely, because when you shop locally, you're creating livelihoods here. Um, um, invest in companies uh, that have a sustainable approach uh, also, uh, um, because you know, there are some people, there are some private companies that have money that want to put um, I like the carpooling systems. Uh, we don't have public transportation now. It's still a hard topic to open up. Let's try to use alternative mode of transport. Walking, carpooling is um, is becoming a great uh, a great trend across across the world. Also, energy efficient equipments. Uh, as simple as that. When you go by, just make uh, informed and educated uh, decisions about what you buy from uh, from the shops across. Uh, in Lebanon and also across the world. I would like to end with this latest, uh, so the most recent uh, uh, report from, uh, from IPCC that said uh, that uh, clearly said that today we are at 1% increase uh, uh, from the pre-industrial levels. Uh, the warming, if we continue like this, we will reach a three degrees, not a two, not a 1.5, but a three degrees warming by the end of the century which means that the world has to reduce emissions by 49% if we want to still bring these emissions down, which means that the world has to reach 100% carbon neutrality by 2030 and have 85% of the world's electricity from renewable energy. So you can just imagine the scale of effort that the world has to do. And then again, the developed world has the biggest share and the biggest responsibility to do this, but we are uh, in, this, uh, in this too. And finally, the report says that the world has only 12 years, 12 years um, uh, or 10 now to, uh, to effectively complete a just transition in economy and in society. Um, this is it for me, uh, the optimism or the skepticism, I'm not sure. Um, I will be more than happy to answer questions and open any debates uh, that, uh, that you deem fit. Fadi, I'll give you the floor. Okay, I think, uh, hello, Fadi? Uh, 
Thank you. Sorry, I Thank was, you, I was talking by myself. It was muted, so I, <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it again. So thank you very, very much, Leah, for this very uh, inspiring webinar. Uh, very, very interesting. And we'll open the floor for discussion now, for questions. We have many, many questions in the chat box. We'll, I will ask you these questions and we'll open the floor for the colleagues and for students to ask their questions. Meanwhile, please, you have a link in the chat box to assess this webinar. This is very important. We need your opinion to, uh, to work on our webinars uh, and to make them better and better and better. So uh, while you complete the assessment sheet in the link that is it's in, the, in the chat box, uh, maybe I can ask you some questions. Uh, Leia, we can see the questions together in the chat chat box, and then we open the floor. We have like, we have like twenty min more minutes. Uh, so, uh, uh, hand ask a question. There are uh, fishery farms in Lebanon. Won't this help uh, when you were talking about CO two emission and about uh, you see the question? Would you like to answer it? Yes, please. Yes, um, yes, for fisheries, uh, yes, there, there is fishery farms, and this is definitely something that can, uh, that can be an, an alternative, but uh, fishery farms usually are different from uh, 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 sea uh, fishing, um, and uh, there's a whole livelihood and a whole ecosystem around the actually going to the sea and fishing. And sometimes uh, it's difficult to raise some types of fish in, uh, in fish farms and not in the sea. Um, I'm not an expert in, um, in fisheries, but what I know and what I can tell you is that, is that maybe the world will be moving into fishing farms, uh, but we would like as much as possible to keep the world and keep livelihoods of people the way they are today. Thank you. Uh, Masad has a comment. It's not a question. Nuclear power is clean for emissions. However, till now, countries did not find the proper management for the waste, which is a higher risk compared to emissions. So uh, Haifa, uh, Haifa, do we have charging stations for that? Yes, we do have charging stations. If you're asking for cars, we do have in Lebanon, Metco. And IPT have charging stations for uh, for electric vehicles, and there's also actually in ABC and in uh, Beirut Souf there are charging stations for cars. Uh, however, personally, I don't see per, um, um, electric cars as the next technology to be adopted in Lebanon. Uh, now uh, the trend is to move into hybrid or plug-in hybrids, and plug-in hybrids and it can work both. Um, with fuel or with, or with electricity, until we have the infrastructure and the clean fuel, the fuel and the clean fuel to shift into electric mobility. Thank you, Leah. Uh, Haifa said uh, concerning the international issue. So let's start by ourselves. Let's start at our level before thinking about international issues. Uh, think globally and act locally, Wadad. Uh, Haifa, other nations are acting on it. Mm -hmm. Rada, uh, comment, comment calculer, estimer les émissions de CO2 au niveau d'un établissement ou même au niveau individuel? Est-ce qu'il y a une application pour pouvoir le faire? So, do, there is an application concerning this kind of. Uh, yes? Yes, yes, great question. Uh, Rada, yes, there is an application. There is actually uh, um, a worksheet on, uh, on our website. I'll try to share. Uh, I'll try to share uh, the website uh, with you all. Um, so where you can actually enter uh, some data that your company or your household uh, uh, has about your electricity bill, uh, your um, motor bill, uh, the fuel that you are using and how much, and that it calculates automatically your CO2 footprint. And recently we have, uh, we have done this on a more, if you want, professional level with university students, with NGO students uh, for campuses. Uh, so now there's a very nice tool for university campuses and schools that can actually give you the CO2 emission per student or per staff. And we are trying to make it, customize it to companies in Lebanon. But there's a generic tool that is already available today. I'll share with you the, uh, the website. Okay. Do you agree? I continue reading meanwhile? Yes, yes, please. Okay. So uh, Naamat, use Android app. Uh, Haifa, but they have to make it affordable. Okay, I have a question. And then Haifa, 
from an organizational point of view, do you think we will reach the target by 2030, the 30%? Are we optimistic to, to reach the target? Um, <laughs> yes, we are, but not because we're doing efforts. It's because, <laughs> it's because we just got a big slap on our faces. <laughs> so um, the socioeconomic situation in Lebanon definitely reduced a lot uh, our emissions. Uh, whether it's from industries, whether it's from energy production, whether it's uh, from transportation. This is the positive side of the... This is, yes, yes, it is. Um, yes. Unfortunately, there were a lot of plans um, on JED. They were just, yani, but the next day to be implemented, like the shift to natural gas that really um, reduces our emissions uh, by two thirds. Uh, there was uh, a lot of work being done on electric and hybrid vehicles and a lot of initiatives were stopped last year after the, the, the economic uh, crisis, which was exacerbated by the COVID situation. Mm -hmm. So far, so good, I would say. We still have 10 years to go. Yes. So Haifa is asking, what are the incentives we have in Lebanon to promote for renewable energy? Um, yes, in terms of incentives. So it depends if you are an individual or a, a company. For companies, uh, there are two mechanisms that companies and entrepreneurs can benefit from. One is the NERIA, NERIA mechanism, that is a financing mechanism through uh, Banque du Liban and through commercial banks, where they give subsidized loans to uh, any activity that a company or an entrepreneur or a development agency does that uses the uh, uh, energy efficient or renewable energy. For example, you are a developer, a constructor, uh, you are uh, um, uh, any activity you have, uh, I don't know, you have an industry that you want to use uh, renewable energy or install wastewater treatment plants, so you can benefit from this subsidized loan. Um, this is one. The second, there's the decree, decree 167, that was issued by the Ministry of Environment and Ministry of Finance, that actually gives tax uh, um, income, income tax deduction and tax incentives on any product that a company uh, wants to import that is green. So you get, uh, you get a complete tax redemption on this, uh, exemption on this. Uh, currently, the Minister of Finance was preparing the application forms that, that will be available online for people and companies that are, uh, that are interested in applying. Uh, but these are at least the two, uh, um, the two uh, uh, incentives that are in place, other than the incentives on cars, on hybrid and electric cars. And also, um, anyway, all technologies that are energy efficient are currently being subsidized indirectly by the government. Um, so this is also something that uh, you might be taking part of without knowing. So Joel is asking a question too. What do you think about the high cost that always associated with sustainable products? Because this is kind of the most limiting factor in higher spread of sustainable businesses. Um, yes, but I think with technological advances, costs will be reduced. Um, as you know, a car when the when a car was was invented. Uh, 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 in, the, in the previous century, it costed, it wasn't affordable for, for, for half of the population. Now everyone can, can get a car. Um, even uh, um, the costs, the reduction of the cost of sustainable product is exponentially decreasing because of competition, because of uh, the role of China and the Chinese production in the market. So it's true, it's still a little bit more expensive than regular product, but I expect with market advances and technological advances, uh, the price to be uh, to be more more affordable. And I totally agree with Maya Kerkour. Yes, Nerea is on hold now. Um, unfortunately, we don't know where we are today. Um, we hope that after this, we can be, we will be able to revise uh, some of these instruments. Um, but at least they have shown a little bit, you know, some some success stories. So if not these instruments, similar instruments. Sami is asking about electro-powered vehicle in Lebanon. Do we have electro-powered vehicle in Lebanon? Uh, a few, few, not a lot. We have a lot of hybrid. I myself have a hybrid car, so it doesn't require electricity. It's just, uh, uh, I just fuel it once a month, maximum. And the rest, it's, a it's kinetic energy and mechanical energy. So it, feeds, it fuels itself. 
electrical a few um, i would say a dozen or uh, maybe 20 25 cars uh, not more uh, because we don't have the infrastructure so this is always a debate do we need to have cars to have the infrastructure or do we have to start with the infrastructure to have cars okay uh, Karim, would it be possible for you to ask your question live, to open your camera maybe uh, and ask your question concerning the projects? Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, hello, Ms. Leo. I was wondering what kind of uh, projects did you take part of in helping the climate change and how can we help and join as activists in the matter? Thank Karim. Uh, well, uh, the first question was what I did for climate change. Was it yes, what kind of projects do you take part of? Yes. So uh, I joined actually the Ministry of Environment and UNDP in 2007. So I've been in this for at least, I don't know, 13, 14 years, uh, where climate change was starting to take uh, shape, at least in Lebanon. It was already a big, uh, a big topic in the world. But uh, we started, you know, we were a project with two persons, uh, a very small team uh, just doing a national communication. Uh, now we are a team of around 10 and there's a big, big family of climate change uh, people involved in Lebanon uh, um, working on climate change. So I've been involved uh, uh, in all of these regulations that I, was, um, uh, I have mentioned. Uh, me and my team, uh, of course, I have a team behind me. We have been involved in all of these uh, mechanisms to law, the decrees, whether from the design to the implement, to the writing, to the lobbying, um, to coming up with the numbers. You know, when they say, I want to remove 10% of your tax incentive, who comes with the 10%? Why 10, not 20, not 30, not 40? So there's a whole study behind it, a cost efficiency, a cost benefit analysis study that where you can weigh how much the government is losing, but how much we are gaining from, you know, uh, air pollution reduction and market uh, um, market growth. So we do all this. Um, I've worked on all the national communication, which is a report that every country in the world should report back to the international community on climate change. So I've, uh, I've led all the work, the scientific work for this. We negotiate climate, uh, climate change agreements. Uh, although we are a small country, but you know, in UN, uh, when in UN talks and in UN negotiations, Lebanon's voice is as equivalent and as equal as China's voice. So believe me, we do take this very seriously. We negotiate fiercely uh, with my team. I have excellent negotiators um, and we have the Minister of Foreign Affairs with us. And uh, uh, believe me when I say that we keep in mind that uh, any agreement that has to be agreed on takes into account uh, um, Lebanon's interest, which, by the way, is very similar to a lot of other countries' interests. I mean, we are not Nahna, we are not an island uh, alone. Um, so it's just really joining efforts. Uh, how can you be involved? Um, internships are usually a great, uh, a great opportunities, but also being involved with uh, you, the UNGC, the Global Compact Network in Lebanon, that work with the private sector, with Lebanon Climate Act, with NGOs, uh, Greenpeace are very active, Interact are very active. Um, also, actually, in our chair, we, we, we actually in our foundation, Diane Foundation, and the chair in uh, Diane Foundation. Also, we have internship, we have projects, so we can collaborate, of course. Diana said, you want to say something about the Fondation Diane concerning the green projects? I don't know if Diana, Diana is still with us. I don't know. Hi, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, I am still here and I'm very interested, especially when uh, there is somebody who says, that uh, we shouldn't do anything for climate change because we are very small in the world. Uh, but uh, you know, I would like to tell him, I don't know if he's still here, uh, when you are driving and uh, you are uh, following a truck that, that is emitting uh, black, uh, uh, black uh, how you call it, uh, emissions, uh, don't you think that it would be much nicer to have cars without uh, black emissions? Uh, I think it's already uh, a better way to breathe. Even if we don't talk about climate change, uh, when you talk about breathing, uh, 
nice, pure air, it's already something that we could do. Uh, and effectively, uh, Paula talked about uh, uh, that uh, there is no more pollution in the air because of the pandemic. But uh, uh, when you are in the mountain and you can look at Beirut, you will see that it is clean, the sky is blue. You don't see this uh, brown uh, cloud that is uh, hiding Beirut as it is, as it was in last years. And really you, you notice that uh, less pollution is very, very good for us, for our well-being, for our health. And also uh, we have to raise our voice for uh, all the world, the whole world that we are here to make progress because we are, it's a testimony for the world. Thank you. Uh, for the project, uh, we are in Fondation Diane doing a lot of projects with uh, uh, entrepreneurs who are uh, beginning a business with a green idea. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that we have already uh, helped financially and operationally uh, 14 startups and uh, we are open to receive more and more if you have new ideas and you want to be entrepreneur and uh, work in this uh, field, uh, we will be very happy to meet you and help you. Uh, did I answer the question? Of course, thank you very much, Diana. Thank you very much. Uh, so before we end uh, so, the webinar, yes, can uh, I answer, please? Uh, yes, I, 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 we, we, we still have some few minutes to debate the question, Namat. Just one thing, if you accept, if you agree, to open all your cameras one more time, to open all your cameras one more time just for a photo, and then we have a few minutes to continue the discussion. But if you agree to open, to open all, really all of you, it will be great if you accept to open your camera for a photo souvenir, all of you, just one second, and then you do whatever you want with the camera. So Natalie will take a screenshot. So I will not use my phone, it will be better. So I can look directly to you. Uh, so we'll take the photo for the page one. Magda, Gada, Rita, Karim, Christy, if you can open your camera. One second, only one second. Thank you very, very much. It's okay. For the page one, Natalie, it's okay. And then page two, if you can open uh, Ahmad, Jana, Huda, Ber, Dana, Christian, Mariam. Okay, this is the page two. If you can open your cameras and then the page three. Thank you very much. So, uh, yes, Naman. That's, that's great, by the way. I can see so many familiar faces. Danny, Yona, Paula, wow. Uh, I wish I could all see you live. Um, and I think uh, uh, just to, to, um, uh, uh, to emphasize, Maya, I see you too. Uh, just to emphasize on what Diana, uh, Diana Fadel uh, so eloquently said. Just the fact that there are so many people now online just participating and putting their heart. You know, it's Friday at seven. No one, I mean, you can do a lot of other things instead of staying in this webinar. But this is the whole spirit. We are really all this together. And as Paula said beautifully, we cannot be apologetic for this. If you do not want to participate in the effort and be a skeptic, it's, you know, it's, it's up to it's up to each and every individual, but the spirit that we are all together in this this is what gives uh, not just Lebanon the world the, uh, the 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 patience and the effort to continue in this. And with all of you guys, with people like Maya working with her private initiative, with schools, with private companies to make a change in Lebanon, uh, Yona with PwC, Danny with the, with you know, with UNC, with, uh, with being with us, you know, then he, he's, he's an NGO, he comes with us to climate negotiations. He goes and negotiates with Lebanon uh, in these negotiations. So thank you so much for being here and not just today, but uh, uh, every day of the year, I know that you are all here. 
Thank you, thank you very much, Leia. So just one more thing before we uh, say goodbye. At the end of this very, very interesting and inspiring webinar, it's our first webinar in the share of Fondation Diane for Education and Ecocitizenship and Sustainable Development, but it's not the last. So our next one will be on, on, on December 8th. If you are interested by another topic concerning another SDG, concerning mental health, so it's on December 8th at 5 p.m. We'll be sending you the, the flyer um, and hope to see you all on December 8th too. Thank you very, very much, Leah. Thank you for all of you. Uh, concerning the survey for the, for the webinar, if you complete it now, it's good. If not, we'll be sending it to you by mail because we need your feedback. Okay, thank you very much for everyone and have a good evening and see you soon. Bye-bye. Leah, you have something to say? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye, Leah. Thank you. Thank you, the Bye, Zana. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.